go live. We can start recording. Um, there we go. That works. Cool. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for coming today. Today we have our third lecture of our, le our spring 2023 lecture series, Kasim Shepard. Just a reminder that we have two more lectures left on April 10th during the college hour. Our own Vanessa Alisa Chukwi will be giving her um, giving a talk about her research on climate equity. And then on April 17th, um, being supported by AIA New Jersey, we'll have Susan C. Rodriguez and that will be at Kane Hall 127 at 5 p.m. So that'll be a different one because it's being sponsored by AIA New Jersey. So quick introduction to our lecture today. Um, Kasim Shepard produces nonfiction media about cities, buildings, and places. Trained as an urban planner, geographer, and documentary filmmaker, he lectures widely about the craft of visual storytelling in urban analysis, planning, and design. His current research project, Self-Help Housing, Incremental Approaches to Shelter since 1965, is supported by fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation and McDowell. His nonfiction film and video work about cities around the world has been exhibited at venues including the Venice Architecture Biennial, the Museum of the City of New York, uh, the United Nations, the Pavilion d'Arsenal um, in Paris, the African Center for Cities at Cape Town, and the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian <laughs> Design Museum. His writing on urbanism has appeared in Next City, Places, Domus, Public Culture, as well as in books and catalogs documenting works by Jeff Menall, David Adde, and others. His first book, City Makers, A Culture and Craft of Practical Urbanism, was published in 2017. Shepard is a, dis a distinguished lecturer at the Spitzer School of Architecture at City College at City University of New York. He taught for 10 years at GSAB at Columbia and has been a guest lecturer in the city's program of London School of Economics and the School of Design at the University of Illinois at Chicago and the Voices Fellow, sorry if I mispronounced that, um, at the Institute for Public Knowledge at New York University. He studied filmmaking at Harvard University, urban geography at King's College London, and urban planning at MIT. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. And then, yeah, you just have to like, just scroll down. Cool. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for the invitation. It's so great to be here. I've never been on this campus before, um, and it's a delight to see you. And I was happy to wander around the studios a little bit, see what people are working on, talk to a few thesis students. Um, and I'd love to hear um, more from uh, you guys about what you're working on if we have time at the end. So please uh, interrupt me, and, um, and then we'll get to some questions. I have lots and lots of stuff to talk about, but I'm going to be judicious and not talk about all of it, and um, and we'll we'll skip around a little bit. Um, but basically, I want to, in general, when I talk to students, in particular, um, especially students of design, I myself was never a student of design, which is why I sometimes think it's funny that I teach in design schools, um, and all of my students are going to be designers, presumably. Um, but particularly when I talk about students of of design, I, I really like to emphasize. Um, the communication aspect of what we're doing um, and what it what it means to actually think about um, urbanism, which is where I come from. Right, I'm, I'm more of an urbanist than than anything else. Although, thank you for I don't know where you dug up that particular bio from, but it had lots of other <laughs> other um, well, there you go. Um, the um, um, lots of other things that I've studied, which I, which will come through in 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 a talk about my work, uh, filmmaking, geography, a bunch of other things. Uh, but urbanism is really what sort of ties it together as a content area. Um, but what I like to think about in terms of why that's important and how we as designers can sort of activate um, uh, an understanding of urbanism that is useful for our work of creating prospective new futures um, is really has to do with thinking about how to represent what's there already, right? How to really sort of infuse our design thinking into a representation of existing context um, that can inform whatever futures um, we uh, are fortunate to try and envision um, in our capacity as designers. Um, so why is storytelling as a, as a, as a frame? Um, part of it comes to me, I love this quote from, from the poet Mueller Kaiser that the universe is made of stories, uh, not of atoms, right? Those of us who think about the built environment all the time, we think a lot about the material world. Um, and the material world is, of course, you know, important and physical and structures our life and enhances certain behaviors and 
um, you know, prohibits other behaviors or inhibits other behaviors. Um, but uh, in addition to those sort of physical barriers that make up the world, um, we also have a lot of things that are more important that are not necessarily material. Um, we think about culture, we think about language, we think about a lot of things that we've come to understand over the course of the evolution of design pedagogy as crucially important to human habitation and life. Um, but stories is a really sort of simple and universal way of understanding some of the, the linking material um, that binds us, right? That makes the universe. Um, but it's also true <laughs> that stories are not just sort of a benign, you know, uh, thing that we tell around the campfire uh, to keep our culture going. Um, they also are uh, power structures that enforce the status quo um, in really important ways. Those who tell the stories are the ones that rule society, those who get to tell the stories. Right. So in thinking about storytelling um, as a practice of city making, as a practice of understanding and representing context in advance of proposing interventions, right, which is what we are trained to do as designers, um, we need to understand both of those dynamics, that stories really are have a material dimension that binds us together into different groups, families, cultures, religions, etc., nations. Um, but also um, that they, they in, in, enhance and enforce um, uh, existing power structures. And that's an important dynamic to sort of keep in mind. Um, storytelling is not new, right? And certainly visual storytelling is something that's been with urban analysis and design um, forever, right? As long as um, we've been creating structures uh, for other and distributing the labor of the creation of those structures, right? As in not just building things ourselves. Um, we've had to create diagrams, right? Um, I often sort of shock some of my students in telling them that architects don't really make buildings, right? They make systems of information with which other people make buildings. Um, uh, but if you think about it at the urban scale as well, we've been thinking about ways to represent urban experience diagrammatically for a long time, right? So we've used mapping to understand urban phenomena. Um, you know, in, in my urbanism classes, I often refer to this, this map of uh, the, the famous um, diagram by Gian Battista Noli mapping Rome in the mid 18th century, trying to understand not public and private in terms of what is has a roof or doesn't, but what a commoner was allowed to walk through or not walk through, and really understanding the grain of the city um, through that kind of analysis, right? Um, we've used maps to understand things like uh, public health and epidemics, famous one from Jon Snow in the mid 19th century. Um, which really sort of announced the twin birth of both urban planning and public health, right? Which originally, um, in the early mid 19th century manifestations, were pretty much the same thing, right? How do we manage all of this industrialization and urban growth? Uh, we need a lot of visual tools to understand the data of doing so, um, and which is how both sort of urban planning and the field of public health got their start. Um, but it's not just about diagrams, it's not just about representations of space. We've always used images to humanize social challenges, and often doing so in ways that have really, really important implications for um, our lives and our livelihoods and our well-being, um, but have a, have a very architectural dimension, right? So these are the photographs that I teach every year um, from Jacob Rees, uh, who photographed sort of the, um, his most famous book from 1890 was How the Other Half Lives, right? Um, uh, looking at uh, slum conditions in the Lower East Side um, with a very specific advocacy goal in mind, right? He wasn't just trying to illustrate uh, how poor immigrants in the Lower East Side were living. That was part of it. Um, and really trying to wake up the middle class and the political class to the realities of the harsh conditions of living in, in these overcrowded slums um, in the Lower East Side. But he really wanted to change the rules. Um, and this work was very, very instrumental in changing um, uh, the rules for, for, for minimum room sizes, for windows and ventilation, all the things that went into the new law tenement um, and te the Tenement House Act of 1901. Um, images have been used in things that are not necessarily just architectural in terms of uh, advocacy, right? Uh, the the uh, getting child labor uh, to be abolished uh, also relied on a bunch of portraits. Um, in many ways that were really an important piece of the advocacy puzzle to really get child labor um, uh, um, uh, prohibited. Uh, but when we think about it in terms of professional practice today, there are lots of different ways in which we can think about storytelling as having a, a practical sort of professional um, development aim, right? Uh, we can think about it in terms of <laughs> advocacy, right? Such as the two examples I just gave, how to persuade elected officials of a particular strategy. Um, we also think you can think about storytelling in the context of community engagement, right? How do we solicit support 
and feedback from the people who uh, are really going to be impacted by the decisions um, that will affect them most. Um, oftentimes when I talk about this, people assume that the kind of storytelling practices that I'm describing are, uh, are coterminous with marketing. Marketing is part of it, but not all of it, right? Uh, marketing, I think of as a convincing a wide public of a particular project's importance and the effectiveness of a particular solution. Um, there are other, other applications that we can think of in terms of public service, in terms of networking, in terms of creating a historical record um, of what we're doing that future scholars can learn from. Uh, one of the things that I think is both most exciting and the most difficult in thinking about storytelling as a strategic practice um, is in project development, right? So it's related to community engagement. But community engagement in most examples oftentimes, unfortunately, takes the, the, the form of, here's this thing I decided, <laughs> what do you think about it? Um, as opposed to what are the problems that we're trying to solve, right? Um, and the way in which the majority of architecture has been sort of formulated as a, as a, in a client service model doesn't always leave a lot of room for, wait, let's define the project brief and the project scope together with those people who will be most affected. But we are seeing, I think, some movement in this in really sort of using storytelling techniques, kind of tweaking that community engagement model that's sort of after the fact uh, to a more proactive earlier in the process. What is the problem that we're trying to solve? And what is your local knowledge? How can your local knowledge be leveraged as an input? Um, because you know the place where you live better than anyone. Um, and so what are the assets there that we can sort of reformulate? When I think about this in practical terms in trying to sort of um, something that runs across all of my projects, and it's not necessarily obvious, um, but there is sort of a, some basic kind of rhetoric 101 that goes into it, uh, you know, thinking about audience, thinking about who is telling the story, who is listening, why they should listen, and there are some basic sort of expository things that some of us learned in sort of, you know, English composition uh, in, in middle or high school, those of us who studied in this country, um, that... Um, that goes something like, you know, first you explain the context, uh, and then the solution, there's an argument with some examples. Um, and there are certain elements that all good stories have, right? Characters, actions, setting, um, and in the traditional mythological model, lessons, right? A moral of the story, right? Which might be implicit rather than explicit, but is generally speaking a part of most of the stories that have endured. Um, and we think about the qualities that really define good stories um, I think you can really bake them down to authenticity, empathy, which is a two-way street, right, and, and clarity, right, <laughs> being as short and cogent as possible. Um, when we think about this in terms of uh, propositional storytelling, right, when you're telling a story about a place in an effort to actually try and change something about it or intervene in some way, um, which is oftentimes the preserve of, of design, it's not the only preserve of design, but it's one of them, um, there's another element that goes into that expository breakdown, which is your vision, right? How is the world going to be different after your solution? Um, which becomes an important part of the process. Um, I don't know why it doesn't like that one slide. There we go. Um, and one of the ways in which I try and break this down even further, this particular moment of trying to articulate your vision, right? We can think about the context in an architectural case as site conditions, right? Uh, your site analysis explaining what it is sort of around you. Um, and But in order to really sort of um, deal with that in a way that's useful and motivating both to your collaborators and your partners as well as to your audience, um, requires breaking it down a little bit more, right? In terms of observation, right? Which I think of as sort of the basic data collection, right, sitting on a street bench and looking how people are moving in and out of a particular retail environment or a particular streetscape, uh, looking at how people are using a particular housing environment, I'm thinking of the three studio thesis projects I just uh, looked at when I get these examples. Um, so observation is sort of your raw data collection, right? Um, and then um, you get to the, the harder part, which actually often happens back at your desk, right, which is the interpretation. What are you doing? with that data, right, with those observations. Um, how are you sort of putting those into some sort of frame that you can turn that into useful information? Both of these steps have to happen before communication, right, which is the public part, where you're sharing uh, this story with some particular audience um, about whom you've asked those questions. Who is telling the story? What is the power and privilege of the person telling the story? What is the power, privilege, and positionality of the person listening to the story? What is those relationships? You've asked all those questions already, before you even get to communication, you have to interpret what you've observed, right? 
Um, and one of the ways in which I think something that binds together a lot of the different projects that I've worked on um, is an understanding that interpretation requires reframing pretty ordinary elements of your everyday existence um, and putting them in a slightly new context. Another way of thinking about this is defamiliarizing things that are otherwise pretty familiar, right? Uh, like those examples of the ways in which people walk in and out of a retail streetscape um, or the ways people inhabit a particular housing environment, how they move around it, how they use their yard, these kinds of questions, right? Those are pretty normal things, and if you just ask someone, how do you use your yard? They might not necessarily have a lot of particular good uh, things that pop to the top of their head in answering that question. Um, but if you take an observation of behaviors and use patterns um, and then actually sort of recontextualize it, make something familiar, somewhat unfamiliar, uh, people can then observe a habitual action and see it in a new light, um, which can then provide uh, the grounds for um, uh, moving forward together on some sort of intervention to enhance that condition in some way, right? So defamiliarization and reframing. Um, and you know, one of the you know maxims we've inherited from architectural history is the notion of form following function. I'm not so sure that I necessarily believe that all the time, but I do believe when it comes to storytelling that the format should follow the content, not the other way around, right? You've got to choose what is the most appropriate format for the story you're trying to tell, um, not try and fit your content into a pre-existing idea of what that might be, right? There are certain traditional formats um, that we use all the time, right? Boards, um, you know, <laughs> renderings, models, uh, certain kinds of diagrams. Those are really important traditions to understand. But when it comes to actually sort of telling a, a, a nuanced and, and coherent story about a place or an idea or a building, um, really thinking about uh, what is the most, is this a book, is this a website, is this um, a blog post, uh, is, should this be a video or should this uh, you know, be an audio piece, should this be something in text, should this be something primarily visual? These are the kinds of questions that should happen after you've done all that observation and interpretation. Um, not before, right? Not so you're not sort of uh, filling in the blanks here. Um, this clown is a really, uh, this mime rather, is a really wonderful example that I often turn to as a great example in urban practice of uh, reframing and defamiliarization. Uh, it comes from uh, Bogota in 2004. Um, it's a famous example of, of a mayor, Antanas Mokus, um, who was confronting a, a really sort of confounding traffic problem in Bogota at this period in time. Um, and the, but the traffic problem wasn't a question of road design, though that contributed to the problems. It wasn't a question of transit access. It wasn't a question of, um, of all of the things that we normally think we can fix in the physical world around how people were uh, using the roads. Um, it had to do with people just not playing by the rules, right? Um, flouting traffic laws um, with, with, with total brazenness. Um, and so his example of how to sort of defamiliarize these habitual conditions, because everyone was in the habit of sort of, you know, driving in a way that made, that made traffic regulation impossible. Um, he thought about it in a very philosophical way. He's actually a, a mathematician originally. Um, he took a very philosophical approach, and a, and a philosophical approach really rooted in the philosophy of art and what art is for in order to try and provoke behavior change among the car owning and driving population of Bogota. Uh, and he went through the different things that often change people's behavior, uh, traditionally speaking, right? Either people uh, admire and respect the law because they're worried they'll get in trouble, uh, or they um, do the right thing because they're worried about they'll feel bad, right, if they don't do the right thing. Well, neither of these things was the case in, in, in the context of uh, traffic uh, pattern uh, and traffic regulation behavior um, in Bogota. Um, and he realized that the only thing that actually would motivate behavior change um, was fear of social rejection, or in other words, public shaming, right? Because people aren't going to do it out of guilt, because nobody felt bad about flouting traffic laws. People aren't going to do about it because they're worried about getting a ticket, because that enforcement mechanism was not working, particularly among the rich. Um, and so this is what led him to hire mimes to publicly shame people in the street for uh, not obeying traffic laws, right? And it was highly effective. And there's been like business school case studies of, um, of the mimes, and it's actually been implemented in other Latin American cities um, with a strong sort of street art, performing arts tradition. Um, this notion of sort of uh, uh, public shaming 
as a way to change behavior, right? Um, and I use that as an example of something, you know, that's very much um, relevant to the physical world, the physical world of streets and traffic and the built environment of our, our road landscapes. Um, but, uh, but the intervention in this case was, um, was not necessarily physical, right? Um, and this, I think, is a really wonderful example of, of defamiliarization in the sort of literary theory uh, definition of it. If you will bear with me for a little bit of jargon just for a moment, um, Viktor Shlavsky, uh, a, an early 20th century Russian uh, theorist of literature, um, described narrative defamiliarization as something that could return sensation to our limbs in order to make us feel objects, to make a stone feel stony, man has been given the tool of art, right? He explains and defines art, something that we um, have been struggling with for some time in a way that I quite like. The purpose of art, according to Shlavsky, is to lead us to the knowledge of a thing through the organ of sight instead of recognition, right? Another way you can think about this is if you've ever taken a figure drawing class and the teacher tells you to draw what you see, not what you know, right? Um, this notion that uh, by estranging objects and complicating form, the device of art makes perception long and laborious. This perceptual process in art has a purpose on its own and ought to be extended to the fullest. Art is a means of experiencing the process of creativity. The artifact itself is quite unimportant, right? So it's not so much about the art that is produced, the artistic object, um, but the, that the notion of organizing an experience that makes something normal and regular, I like guess part of your everyday life, feel somehow different and special such that you understand and are motivated to observe what exactly is going on, what are the dynamic conditions within that experience, right? So that's defamiliarizing something regular, or in the case of the mimes of Bogota, um, making pretty, pretty, like, very widely used <laughs> uh, um, flouting of traffic laws into something that people were all of a sudden noticing in a different way in terms of their own behavior, right? Um, <clears throat> another way I think about this, which is a little bit more um, traditional to, to historical sort of urban studies, is um, something that uh, Kevin Lynch, one of, one of the greatest um, urbanists of the 20th century in this country, uh, describes as the anxiety that a site planner or designer has about the spirit of place, right? Any place, any plan, no matter how radical, has some continuity with the pre-existing locale, what was there before. Understanding a locality demands time and effort, and the skilled site planner suffers a constant anxiety about this, about those things, that continuity between what is there and what you're proposing to be there in the future. And I see this as sort of what a lot of my work really tries to focus on, especially in terms of teaching and giving tools to design students, um, is how do you deal with that anxiety about the spirit of place, those things that can't be quantified, those things that you can't necessarily use any sort of metrics or measurement on, you can't do like a sunshade diagram about it, you can't necessarily create a pie chart um, about the demographic data, about certain aspects of a place, those things that are ineffable that you can't necessarily count. Um, and I think we need some uh, to think sort of very proactively, uh, pedagogically about tools that can allow us to name and express those things and interpret them, observe them first, and then interpret them before communicating them, that context, that spirit of place, that sense of place. Um, um, I, in my own um, educational trajectory, um, this actually started out first um, not in the built environment fields. Um, I studied filmmaking as an undergrad, um, documentary filmmaking specifically, um, and this was actually how I learned how to make movies, um, by slicing 16 millimeter film and taping it together. Um, which gave me a, a really wonderful appreciation for um, one of the mechanisms of defamiliarization that I use most often, particularly in my film work, but also in my writing, um, uh, which is montage, right? Which is sort of the, the juxtaposition of distinct um, elements to form a cohesive whole that is more than the sum of its parts, right? And this, this idea of montage, of sort of assembling and juxtaposing different elements um, to create a cohesive whole is, so, is a tradition that runs um, very deep uh, within urbanism um, and something that I think is a really important idea to, to continuously sort of reassert its kind of theoretical and philosophical importance. Um, um, it obviously had a lot of really important, you know, the, the kinds of, the, the fullest expression of montage is in sort of city symphony films uh, from, the thir from the late 20s and early 30s, like Man with the Movie Camera and Berlin Symphony of a Great City. 
Um, but it also runs through very important um, traditions in how we have communicated and told stories about large-scale urban and regional change in this country. These same techniques that were developed by the Russian avant-garde um, for uh, the purposes of, of polemical documentary filmmaking uh, were also used during the New Deal uh, by our own government in, in selling um, the, the, the rationale for things like the Tennessee Valley Authority and the Hoover Dam. Um, it also, though, comes up in sort of the great sort of iconic fight uh, that continues to um, uh, convey a lot of the terms of contemporary urbanism, um, which is this, this idea, which I still think is sort of reductive and, and could be a little bit more nuanced, of a, of a clash between you know, top-down ideas um, in, in the vein of Robert Moses or bottom-up ideas in the vein of Jane Jacobs. Um, I'm sort of less interested in the context, the content of that debate, which I think is tired and over-referred to, uh, but more in the method, the method that each of these two uh, individuals um, used in trying to make their cases. And in the case of Jane Jacobs, it was very much through writing another exercise of montage, of defamiliarizing a pretty regular street scene, right? Just describing what's going on when she looks outside her window and seeing what's going on on her block. Um, but as Marshall Berman reminds us, uh, while her prose often sounds artless, um, in fact, she's working within an important genre of modern art, the urban montage, right? And talks about how the way in which she juxtaposes these very distinct elements of urban experience when describing what's going on on her block in Greenwich Village um, is what leads up to the, to, 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 to the argument that she's making about, you know, eyes on the street, about mixed use, um, about all these things that we have taken as prescriptions um, when instead I think we should be taking them as methodologies, right? To proceed from the particulars to the general, not the other way around, to think inductively, um, to observe all those details and then interpret them in a way that allows us to learn by looking, right? Not to look for examples that prove our hypothesis, right? Um, in my own work, this has taken me on a really wonderful journey, sort of thinking about montage and defamiliarization um, and thinking about sort of making sort of pretty regular aspects of urban experience uh, somehow um, uh, looking at them in a new light. Um, and I've been able to do this in a bunch of different sort of modalities. Uh, teaching is a huge part of what I spend most of my time doing right now. Um, but I've also been really lucky to work in a lot of different media and different formats um, and thinking about this kind of stuff, a, a lot of uh, research and writing. A lot of consulting with um, nonprofits and, and, and design firms on how they tell their story, um, as well as um, building off of my original training as a documentary filmmaking, um, a lot of work in exhibition and, and video installation. Um, and I'll share with you a couple sort of highlights of that. But again, you know, what sort of the, the biggest part of this for me right now at this point in my career is the teaching piece. Um, and for me, what I see as my sort of role in an architecture school, in an architecture pedagogy, is in trying to give people tools um, to deal with that sense of place um, when you can't count it, right? Um, when you can't necessarily measure it. What are some of the ways that you can represent the essences of urban experience, um, what, which might be through using documentary filmmaking technique, or it might be through writing, or it might be through photography, or other forms of visual communication, um, that can really sort of add a little bit of nuance to those things that you can't necessarily um, diagram. Um, and so in my film and video work, this has taken a lot of different forms. Uh, my first sort of really big project early in my career was um, uh, 16 videos, about 16 cities around the world for the, um, the Venice Architecture Biennale. Uh, in 2006 was the first time that this, at the time it was the largest architecture exhibition in the world, it was the first time it was focusing on cities, um, in particular, uh, instead of sort of you know jewel box architectural masterpieces, right? Which is traditionally what it had showcased. Um, and 2006, the the reason they decided to do it in that year is that the UN had predicted that 2007 would be the tipping point when uh, more than 50% of the world would live in an urban situation, right? Uh, whereas in 1900, uh, it had been about 10%. Now I don't like those statistics. I think they're deeply misleading because people different countries define who lives in a city in very different ways. Um, however, it did sort of speak to a, um, a broader shift in the public consciousness about the importance of cities, right? And the importance of cities um, in terms of sustainability, in terms of political culture, in terms of a lot of things that are the big pressing issues of our time. Um, and so the Venice Biennale that year focused on 16 cities around the world. Um, and it presented them primarily through um, 
this kind of sort of infographic uh, display that's become kind of um, de rigueur in sort of exhibition making in this era. A lot of statistics, this is LA, 80% drive to work, a lot of aerial photographs, a lot of information about um, the basic conditions in the 16 cities that were chosen, which were all very large cities, um, but not a lot, and a lot of context, but not a lot of, um, of a sense of what it was like to be in any of these cities, right? Um, and so that's where I got this um, uh, wonderful gig um, uh, to try and uh, fill that gap uh, through filmmaking. Right. So the, the curator, the, the director of the exhibition said, I have all this information, all this data about these cities. I want to highlight massive urban scale projects in all of them, uh, but I don't have a really good way of really providing what it's like to be in any of them. Um, could you, as a young filmmaker, either hire a, could curate a filmmaker team from each city to make a little short video? Or could you get a crew and helicopter into these 16 cities and make a short film yourself? Um, and I said, well, actually, I think neither of those two strategies is appropriate or sufficient. And you need a little bit of a hybrid because in an exhibition context, you want something that is collectively coherent, right? Where you, ha where you actually really are hitting on your thematic points of density and mobility and public space that were the sort of key anchor points of the exhibition. Uh, but you also want something that's locally relevant to the people who live in these places. Um, and so helicoptering in is not really going to be a good solution for, for that because um, I don't know a lot of these places that well, but nor would getting a different film from each city really satisfy the needs of your exhibition. So I proposed a hybrid approach where I would um, collect unedited footage from um, local artists in each of the cities um, and then edit it together alongside uh, archival footage that I assembled from each of these cities because I was really interested in the fun fact that the history of cities as a discipline, where we really sort of seriously looked at cities uh, sociologically, anthropologically, in terms of their economics, uh, is is about the same um, as the history of cinema, right? Both of them got their start in the 1880s, thinking about cities seriously and, and the invention of cinema. Um, and so I amassed historical footage of each of these cities uh, from that 100-year time span, um, got local unedited footage from local artists, uh, edited together, and then if there was something missing, I would sometimes go and shoot myself. Um, with a local crew, but that was a sort of basic idea for creating these urban montages that would complement these, you know, large diagrams about density and, and, and other sort of infographic approaches to these cities. Um, another exhibition, I, uh, a film I did was, was a little closer to home, so I felt very comfortable shooting this one entirely myself. Uh, this was a, uh, in 2010. It was about 10 years of design and planning uh, on, in the Bloomberg administration at a time that we thought that administration would only be two terms instead of three. Um, and again, there was all this, all these photographs of these rezonings and of all these mega projects and not a lot of emphasis on what it felt like. Uh, so I made this, um, uh, single, um, single channel installation, a video installation that was sort of a day in the life of the city through five rezoned neighborhoods, uh, one in each of the boroughs. Um, another project where I used sort of the montage approach to defamiliarizing, uh, pretty, pretty regular conditions was uh, this exhibition at the UN the following year. Uh, this was an exhibition um, uh, curated by the, by the Cooper Hewitt uh, Museum, but it was held at the United Nations lobby. Um, and it was about design solutions to extreme poverty in informal settlements um, around the world. It's called Design with the Other 90% Cities, which is kind of a mouthful of a title. Um, but again, they had these, and in this case, it wasn't architecture. Um, it was all kinds of design, right? So they had a lot of product design, industrial design, you know, things from like water filtration devices were on display to a bicycle that you could assemble from a kit of parts from found objects, uh, you know, uh, a, a balloon that was mapping these informal settlements through these very lo-fi photography, lots of very cool multi-scalar uh, different kinds of design solutions that were being used in collaboration with communities in informal settlements in very, very, very challenging circumstances of housing precarity. Uh, but again, they were like, but what, how do we tell people what it actually feels like? So I used a similar approach to what I'd done in Venice, um, and um, I chose six neighborhoods, six informal settlements all around the world that all had a different relationship to the city that they were sort of adjacent to. Uh, some were old, some were new. Um, and my, I had a big agenda for this project, which was the way in which informal settlements are so often portrayed um, is as uh, primarily as residential environments, right? Which of course is their, their most basic function, providing shelter, which is 
in the case of informal settlements, self-built by the residents. Um, but I wanted to show the, how they were so much more than that, right? How having spent a lot of time growing up, visiting a lot of informal settlements in, in South Asia in particular, um, that these are not just residential environments, right? These are places where people go to school and have their shops and have their beauty salons and um, go to, you know, worship. Um, uh, so I really wanted to assemble unedited footage from local uh, artists and journalists um, in these places, as well as at this point, by this point, five years later, people had cell phone video, so I could get a much wider range of uh, submitted material, whereas in 2006, it was only people who had actual cameras. 2011, uh, people have um, starting to have video on their phone. Um, so I had a much wider range of material with which to make this uh, three-channel installation, and then also a single channel of, of sound, which went throughout the entire lobby of the UN. So you were hearing the sounds of these six cities um, as you moved around this exhibition. Uh, and that exhibition went around the world. This is in Cape Town and other places. Uh, the last exhibition I did for the, for the Cooper Hewitt was um, uh, about design responses to poverty in the United States. Um, and this one, um, I took a kind of a different approach because um, assembling unedited footage works really well when you're trying to explain an exterior condition, like how people live in, on the street. Uh, it works much less well in the context of American poverty, where so much of it is hidden behind closed doors that actually looks uh, indistinguishable from other neighborhoods. Um, so this one took a more traditional documentary approach where I actually found specific characters and followed them around um, in, the, in these four different contexts, all in the state of Ohio, um, uh, urban, rural, suburban, and post-industrial. Um, and, but I, again, those are all sort of video projects, um, but I use the same exact approach when I'm approaching sort of writing. Uh, this is a, a, um, the book that was mentioned that came out in um, 2017. Where I, which is based on this um, uh, uh, website that I founded um, called Urban Omnibus, which is still existing, um, uh, produced by the Architectural League of New York, um, where every week we would tell a different story, which we thought of as sort of good ideas for the future of cities around the world that were tried and tested in New York. Um, and what I realized at the end of this process of you know six years of, of running this online sort of repository of good ideas that were really diverse in terms of their discipline, right? Like one week it would be a interview with a civil engineer working on the Statue of Liberty, the next week it would be a mural artist in Queens, the next week someone working on food justice from an advocacy perspective in Southern Brooklyn. Um, but what I realized in, 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 in reflecting on all of this, um, all of these stories that we collected, uh, was that it really could serve to redefine who is actually making cities today um, and, and kind of take it away from an exclusive focus on um, either you know, political decision makers, uh, elected officials, uh, or designers. Both of those are really important players in the process of city making, um, but they're not exclusive to who is actually making change in neighborhoods today, right? Uh, so I wanted to kind of um, expand the tent a little bit um, and think about city making from a different perspective, um, get beyond an exclusive focus on understanding cities as just sort of designed uh, environments that are received. I mean, this is Brooklyn Bridge Park. I love it. It's beautifully designed. I go there all the time. This is a really important part of making cities, designing really functional landscapes, but it's not the only part, right? Um, we also have to think beyond sort of uh, about who is actually making cities, right? Um, who is actually sort of uh, implementing the plans that we design? Um, how are they sort of involved in this process of city making? Um, and these are people who are professional. It's their job to help make cities, right? But then there's also a lot of really, really interesting work where it's not necessarily anyone's job at all, right? But a lot of volunteer activity, which really we started to track between 2008 and 2015, which was the era that I was covering in the book, and now it's even more so with the, after the pandemic, uh, but informal sort of tactical interventions in urban space. This is Corona Plaza in Queens, um, which, you know, I often contrast with the High Line, right? These were happening at the exact same time. On the one hand, you had a disused piece of infrastructure uh, that through a tremendous amount of advocacy with a tremendous amount of support of incredibly wealthy people was able to transform into this wonderful landscape. Um, but it's not, it's a wonderful place. I love the Highland too. It's not a very replicable model because of the real estate economics, because of the way in which they, um, they sort of leveraged a lot of sort of um, people with a tremendous amount of influence. You can't necessarily do this anywhere you have a dis, uh, disused industrial asset that you want to turn into a park. Um, but this, this model from Corona Plaza is a little bit more applicable, uh, or a little bit more replicable, rather, 
um, of taking sort of a, an abandoned sort of parking area traffic triangle um, and just with a simple tactical intervention of planters um, and movable seating and string lights um, really re changed the way in which people saw this parking area and, and got to start to think of it as a public space. Um, and then through that sort of make a case um, over time with the partnership of really important partners like the Queens Museum and others uh, to convince the city that this should be demapped as a public right of way and turned into a plaza. Um, uh, which really, and thinking about stewardship in different ways, the different ways that volunteer action um, really can sort of be a part of the shaping of cities. Um, and and I, I sort of assembled all these stories that we'd taken from the website um, and, and, and tried to put them into these buckets, um, public space, um, information technology, um, infrastructure and housing, which are sort of the traditional areas of, of thinking about urbanism. But to do so um, and really try and put together all these stories and read them in with a re close reading of sort of the intellectual history of urbanism uh, to come up with a series of imperatives um, of how we can really think about this culture of who's making cities today um, and, and really try and advance a set of principles about that. Um, so for public space, it was, it was the notion of incorporating long-term use and maintenance along with the practice of citizenship into how we think about public space, how it's designed and how it's delivered thinking about things like community gardens in East New York or something simple like creating a birdhouse with the Gowanus, um, which is a fun story. Read the book for more. Um, in terms of infrastructure, how we can think about it as a constituent element of landscape and something that performs multiple functions, not just one at a time, um, and looking at the history of that. Um, lots of examples. These are the technology examples that really trying to contrast this kind of overly instrumented, computerized, uh, ubiquitous computing model of Hudson Yards with uh, with, a, with an example like this from the Red Hook Houses, one of the largest public housing developments in Brooklyn where people had to make their own Wi-Fi system after Superstorm Sandy because the big internet providers didn't think it was worth their time to do so. Um, uh, and lots of other examples. The housing examples are kind of the most um, in-depth and complicated, so I'll skip, I'll skip a, uh, through those now. Um, but just to say that thinking about housing, um, and particularly in terms of thinking about housing in a way that reconfigures existing housing to meet shifting demographic needs is really what led me on to the work that I'm doing now, um, which is a really some specific focus on housing and particularly on the notion of agency, um, on the agency of residents um, in creating their own housing solutions. Um, so I've done a lot of writing about this. Um, an, an article that came out not too long ago was about sort of a history of community land trusts, which looks at examples in the Bronx and also in Puerto Rico um, of people sort of getting together to pool their resources and, and, and separate the ownership of the house from the ownership of the land and create a, a bunch of democratic mechanisms to do so. Um, looking at that in, the his, in terms of the history of the civil rights movement um, and other sort of uh, precedents that led into the formation of that model. Um, and it's what led me to my current project, which is what I'll leave you with, um, which is an exhibit that if any of you ever make it across the river, I hope you go and see before May 7th um, at the Spitzer School of Architecture where I teach. Um, and this is an exhibit about um, uh, flexibility and agency in multifamily housing. Um, and it really sort of tries to excavate the history of this, um, this Dutch think tank from the 60s uh, called the SAR or the Foundation for Architectural Research. Um, and uh, the exhibition is called Mass Support. Um, and in it, we really tried to sort of, um, in the first iteration of this exhibition, which we held in, in the Netherlands, uh, it was really about just this history, right? This history of this cool, interesting, overlooked group from the 60s and how they were thinking about um, trying to introduce flexibility into housing, how to make massive, huge housing systems that uh, had a lot more user consultation uh, before in a pre-design phase, right? They really worked very, very hard. They used a lot of one-to-one -one models to have prospective residents sort of try out where exactly they wanted their walls um, so that you could have variation um, in, in, these, in these large multifamily buildings. Um, uh, so in one version of the exhibition, we just focus on that history. Uh, but in the contemporary one, using this incredible wall system designed by Office Ka, thank you, Stephanie, um, we uh, were able to both present the historical material on this wall system but then juxtapose it with um, contemporary examples of projects that um, are really sort of today kind of um, um, not necessarily directly influenced by this historical work, um, but are in their own different ways thinking about questions of resident agency, of flexibility, of change over time, and really of 
the possibility of using modular systems and advances in construction technology with prefabrication um, in order not to create more standardized forms, um, but actually forms that can be more flexible and more responsive to the diversity of household types um, that we have uh, in, in our society today. Um, and so this is another sort of example of thinking across um, um, different sort of uh, media and different sort of formats and figuring out what is the most appropriate way to tell the story. Um, you know, 15 years ago, I would have thought this would be a film with my film training. Um, it actually worked a lot better as an exhibit, right? Because it's a lot of really specific historical diagrams and letters and uh, uh, things that really sort of show a context and a time when people were thinking about housing differently because of the historical factors that were influencing that moment. World War II, the destruction of European cities, um, the need to build a million housing units in 10 years, which is what these Dutch guys were reacting to. Um, but then really finding, um, by, by sort of focusing on and defamiliarizing this, this old history, um, its residences with today, right? So uh, in my state across the river, um, our governor uh, has just announced, you know, she wants 800,000 units of housing to be built in the next 10 years, right? Um, which is necessary, right? And in fact, one of the things that she said that they claimed in the president's study was how New Jersey had actually built um, uh, housing at a rate that was roughly equal to the rate of job growth, um, whereas New York State was 1.1 million housing units behind its job growth, right? So there were 1.1 million new jobs over the last 10 years um, and almost no new housing units, right? Um, which is what led to the desire to build so much housing so quickly. Um, and so in that context, it becomes even more important and relevant to dig up some of these quirky, obs potentially obscure historical examples of, of other times when we had to scale up the supply of housing that quickly, um, and but reminding people that you don't have to do that um, at the cost of the self-determination of the people who are going to live in it. And in fact, you can actually, um, if you have sort of a, you know, an, a, an approach that uses all this funky construction technology stuff, as well as a commitment to deep listening, um, to engagement, to understanding people's story and where they're coming from and how their life experience is very unique and how you might be able to translate between that uniqueness and that diversity um, and the set of options that you're able to provide um, using a language of design. Thank you. Any questions? Well, I mean, I'm a, you know, just from my documentary filmmaking training, there's no better data source than talking to people, um, which is sometimes really hard and, and intimidating and other times not. I mean, I had a whole class on documentary film technique for architecture students, and the only requirement was that they had to interview a stranger. Um, and that was like really, really complicated and difficult, and everyone kept making excuses. Nobody emailed me back, so I couldn't do the interview. And then we had this like one day charrette challenge as just like a fun school wide activity um, about our immediate neighborhood in Harlem. And everybody went out and got like amazing interviews with people because they only had four hours to do it. And they're like, hey, sorry, I got four hours to do this thing. Would you please tell me about your neighborhood and the street corner? And there was this unbelievably rich content in, in interview format um, that my students who had a whole semester to do it were like, that's way too hard. But, but, when, but when they were just, confronted with how do you actually learn something really quickly. Now, in those kinds of situations, you have to understand, as I mentioned briefly, like there's always a power dynamic. There's always a, um, uh, there's, you have to be very, you have to have humility and understand that you're an outsider in these situations. You don't ever sort of stick your camera in anyone's face without permission. Um, the more time you spend at a place, the more comfortable you will feel in in talking to people and the more comfortable people will feel talking to you not just because they recognize you but because there is a difference in your body language once you're you know been to a place three or four times um, and people recognize that subconsciously and are much more likely to um, be forthcoming 
Um, and you have to respect people's wishes. I mean, I've done a lot of people who do film projects in my classes. You know, everybody is like really into street vendors, right? So they're like, we're gonna and the, and street vendors. You know, many of them are undocumented. Are like, no way, right? But I will happily like speak into your microphone, right? And that's that's also really really wonderful, rich information. Um, I think thinking about observation and interpretation as two separate steps is is a helpful phrase thing because you don't need to figure it all out when you're on the site. You just need to get as much stuff as you can. Um, and then figure out what are the patterns that you can draw from it when you're back in your studio, you know, processing the photos or whatever it is. Um, I think that's really useful. I mean, this also, that comes from documentary filmmaking. Like, I often describe the particular kind of documentary filmmaking in which I was trained, which was like cinema verite or a particular kind of observational approach to documentary where there was, we weren't allowed to have voiceovers or, or even interviews sometimes. You just had to kind of shoot first and then construct a narrative from that footage. Um, and I often describe that process like it's kind of like writing a book, but you can only use words that you put in a bucket last week, and you can't add any new words, right? So it's very different from painting, where you where revision and creation are both part of the same stage, right? And writing, right? Where revision and creation are both you do them at the same time, right? Uh, in filmmaking, in documentary filmmaking, you don't do it that way, right? Sometimes you have a script, sometimes you have some plan. But for the most part, you shoot as much as you can, and then you go and figure it out. Um, and I think site analysis um, could benefit in some contexts from that if you have the kind of time ledger, um, where you're not, you don't have a, you have a, you have a list of, you have a wish list of things you want to figure out. You have a whole lot of open-mindedness about things that you didn't think about as questions, but that you're noticing, right? And I, I mean, something that when I'm giving a version of this to film students uh, or social science students in particular, this happens a lot when I was lecturing to sociology PhD students at NYU um, and teaching them filmmaking techniques for the first time. So these are people who don't think about the built environment as much as you do. They think about sort of social stratification, right? Um, and as a result, they would always come back with a particular kind of footage when they were introduced to filmmaking technique as the first time. And I, I would often say to them, I understand that you're deeply invested in equity and you're deeply concerned about social justice, but you need to stop bringing in images of what space does to people and instead bring me images of what people do with space, right? Um, and because that's always, it's, first of all, it's more economical. It's going to communicate a whole lot more about how that space is used. You know, I think about this in a very simple way, like a very simple example of what I mean by what people do with space, right, is like, I live across the street from a from a huge tower in the park public housing complex, um, and I walk through it every day to get to the or every time I go to the grocery store to get groceries, right? And the um, and there would so an example of what I was describing with the sociology students is they would confronted with that condition would take like pictures of like the fences that were blocking off you know access to the yards, right? And I was like, yeah, sure, it's a cultural environment that's over securitized and you know not designed for hanging out in public space but a better image of how the public space is overdetermined and poorly not designed for use is to actually show in the routes that people are taking through the snow which you can see from their footsteps to get to the grocery store on the other side right like that's what people are doing with space not what space is doing to people um, and I think that's a that can be a really productive lens to bring into any kind of situation where you're trying to understand how the physical environment either enhances or inhibits particular behaviors. Um, is is how are people getting around the design, right? What are the desire lines um, that are actually sort of telling you more about how that space is used than about how it was designed or how you should be used? Um, so that's my sort of side analysis advice. I think we have time for one more question. Yeah. Or was it, was it about uh, was it resistance or 
Right. No, that's an interesting example. So yeah, I didn't I didn't put any images of that. But yeah, one of my consulting projects was um, for Freedoms Park, which is on the southern end of Roosevelt Island, which is a really beautiful space and a very sort of unusual space because you can see the the UN, you can see all of the Queens waterfront, you can look down the East River. Um, and yeah, it was it was that nobody the park managers thought that not enough people knew about the park. But it's an interesting example of 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 the of format following content because they actually called me um, to make a video, right? They were familiar with my video work and were like, "Can you make a video about how beautiful our park is?" And I was like, "I would love to. It would be so fun for me to film these beautiful Louis Kahn like angles, but like." Who's gonna watch your video? And they're like, I don't know. If you make a video, I guess we'll put it on our website. I was like, when was the last time you watched a video on someone's website? <laughs> like that's just not actually going to do and meet any of your goals. And as much as fun as it would be, and I and I'm glad that you're you know want to give me budget to make that video. I think what would be more useful um, is if you really thought about what are some of the other narrative opportunities that you could have on your site. Um, that could expose people to this sort of rich history of like FDR and the history of human rights in the context of the same person who signed the internment for all the Japanese people with, while you're looking at the UN and looking at the East River um, and looking at this huge transformation of the, of the skyline of Queens like uh, is maybe is there opportunities for a you know a, an app audio like acoustic guide thing right um, is there a way to activate a tour program? So that was what I was actually doing in that consulting project was like scenario planning for different kinds of media products that could enhance the experience uh, that you could also access when you weren't there, right? So that, that could be kind of like a, um, a, a visitor experience guide that you could, that could also like encourage you to like get on that cool gondola, right? To get to, um, and really thinking about it from a planning perspective of, also, what, how, where are you in the ecology of cultural institutions with, you know, Noguchi on, uh, um, in Long Island City and all these things on the east side? Like, so it was kind of a, a we called it an ideas charrette, um, but it was essentially really, I, I took the staff and then a bunch of um, key stakeholders and then a bunch of people that I just invited um, to into a, a like, um, a process of, um, of, of thinking about the discrete media objects that could actually enhance that experience um, and not like one single like video about how cool it was that no one would ever see and would not drive any more visitor engagement. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all.